Morning, Tamale and Beyond. We're live on W93.5 in Wa and Beyond. Coming up this evening, Senior Staff Association of the University of Ghana, Legon, declares indefinite strike effective immediately. This evening, we explore the implications of academic work and the various campuses as well here on Hot Edition. Also, the NDC suspends Northern Regional Vice Chair over the assault case. We have details for you, plus some information from the national executive committee of the ndc also in the package this evening the national executive committee of the governing new petote party is holding a crunch meeting aimed at addressing lingering challenges barely 10 days to the party's parliamentary primaries we'll take you live to alisa hotel where this all-important meeting of the national executive committee of the npp is currently underway we have these plus the latest in business sports and entertainment coming up over the next 60 minutes here on hot edition on 3fm 92.7 remember we're streaming live on facebook and x at 3fm 927 what we're learning as well is that over 300 and 137,000 senior high school students are yet to report to school in the western north region according to the conference of heads of assisted senior high schools plus the minerals commission has also reportedly distanced itself from the controversial sml gra contract we have details of that here on hot edition i am alfred council let's get into the details now <laughs> Straight to the University of Ghana, where we understand the Senior Staff Association of the Universities of Ghana, that's Universities of Ghana, have also uh, declared an indefinite strike with immediate effect. Now, this Senior Staff Association strike is not limited to th just the University of Ghana, Legon, but all the public universities across the country. Uh, the strike follows what the unions describe as government's persistent disregard for welfare of their members and other conditions of service. The industrial action is to protest the government's delay in releasing tier two pension funds and a directive by the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission for the cancellation of payment of overtime for weekend and holiday work. Now, the action comes a few weeks into the reopening of universities for the new academic calendar at a news conference this afternoon, the union directed its members across the 16 public universities to withdraw their services without further delay. Services to be affected include the processing of student admissions and graduations, medical services, security, dental care, laboratory facilities, hostel accommodations, mortuary services, laborers, cleaners, maintenance and estate management. This is a member of the leadership of the Senior Staff Association of the Universities, that's public universities in Ghana, addressing the press earlier today. This avoidable decision has been occasioned by government continuing disregard for the welfare of university senior staff concerning critical issues of pensions and conditions of service. At the 17th, 17th National Executive, Executive Council meeting held on 25th of November 2023, SSA UOG learned with great shock and disappointment that government has failed upon several prompts to release the tier two pension contributions of our members to the board of trustees for effective management since February 2023. Despite our immediate plea to the government for the release of these funds, they have refused to comply, leading to this unfortunate situation. Well, so that's just aspects of this, of the press conference also addressed by the Senior Self Association of the Universities of Ghana, but thankfully we have the president of this association. I'm talking about the Senior Staff Association of the 16 universities 
public universities in this country uh, who have declared an indefinite strike action beginning immediately. That's today. Now, Mr. Isaac Donko is joining us on the telephone. Mr. Donko, thank you so much for joining us here on Hot Edition. First of all, uh, I'm reading from the press statement that you, you put out uh, at the press conference earlier today that uh, th there's been issues with the release of your pension funds and also uh, that's what's that in fact they said government's delay in the release of tier two pension funds what exactly has led to this delay has, has, has government been telling you why they've delayed in re releasing your tier two pension funds <coughs> thank you my brother for having me thank you for the opportunity uh, for the reason we the leadership of the association we can't tell the reason can best be told by government. So this question can be best answered by government and its agencies. But I'm sure that at some of your meetings, you've asked questions as to why the delay, right? And what did they tell when you? When you ask the questions, the answers are, answers are not forthcoming. They will just give you a simple answer that the monies will come because there's no money. But we can also wait. We are waiting, and this thing has happened before. 2010 to 2016, the same thing happened. They started payment, and the, uh, the Pensions Act, when it fought for a month, you have to pay 3% penalty. For six years, government was not paying. So when they started payment, we asked for the penalty, an amount of almost 200 and something million Ghana cities. If they were using the right penalty, the, the right percentage, that is the 3% percentage the month, but they use simple interest and they gave us just 51 million a month that the association and members have lost. So we are asking them to do the needful. We are asking them to use the appropriate interest rate. Those monies, we are not going to allow government to take it for free. It is our own pension money. It is our own hard-earned money. So we are asking them to release those monies. Aside the nine or ten months that is being owned to us, they should still continue to do the proper calculation of the previous one and release it together with this one before you can call off our strike. Otherwise, we are going to stay home for a very long time. I see. Well, you said that in the meetings that you raised this matter, government's response is that there is no money. Is that what they told you? Yes. That is the answers they used to give us. That there's no money, so you should exercise patient. Money when money when they get money, they will release the funds to the farm managers. But you can't just deduct my pension for almost a year. Within a year, then you pay just two months. This is unacceptable. Nobody will accept this. So how long has this? There's no money. Reason been been given to you? Oh, several. Anytime you ask them to pay the money, they will tell you that it's a special patient. And you remember last year, there were uh, head cuts, and our pension was badly affected. And now release the one that is in your custody, and you don't want to release it. Now, uh, how about this directive by the Ghana T Tertiary Education Commission for the cancellation of payment of overtime for weekend work and, and holiday work as well? I mean, uh, did, did, did GTEC give any reasons for the cancellation of this overtime payment? My brother, it's sad that nowadays labor is no more respected. You go, you prepare your proposal, you go and sit on negotiation tables, you finish, you sign. This is your condition of service. You, as a labor person, you respect the part that you're supposed to oblige. Then government and its agencies will just disregard the contract between you and them. And this is what is happening. By law, labor acts are supposed to do overtime when I appear on weekends and public holidays. Per our conditions of service, it has been agreed upon. So why is it that I'm coming to work on weekends public holidays, what is due me, you don't want to pay me. So it is sad. It is a deliberate attempt. It is very deliberate from fair wages and JTEC. It, it, it will interest you to know that our members at tech, last, last two months, they were deducted. 
monies that is duly belongs to them, work that has been done, and money is paid because of said directives, management of uh, tech have to deduct those monies from their salaries. And the people are not crying. It is so sad. What is happening? These are labor laws. It is plain and white. You work on weekends, you receive double pay. You re- work on public, uh, public holidays, you receive double pay. So what is happening again? Are we changing the laws? And if you want to change the laws, it is also there that if you want to change the rules or the laws governing uh, labor, you engage, the parties must meet and engage. We Both of us have to uh, understand or agree upon before we take action. You don't sit at your corner and you take decision because you think you are the head or you are the boss. This is unacceptable. And we, as senior staff, we are not ready to, I mean, go to any of these uh, rules. We are never ready. And we won't allow anybody to vary our contract or conditions of service. So, that will never happen to us. Well, when this was first communicated, was, was there any attempt to engage the Ghana Church Education Commission on this matter? It will interest you to know that this was first communicated we went to Fair Wages and Service Commission. Commissioners wrote to uh, GTEC that senior staff, senior staff in Ghana here are supposed to do overtime. GTEC had that letter. They kept it. Then, on the 7th of November 2022, the same Fair Wages wrote back to GTEC again that, no, now we don't cover for overtime. So why is the double stance here? What, what happens to your earlier communication that we call for over time? And they even attach our conditions of service to that communique or that letter. So why the double stance? Today you say A, tomorrow you say B. Uh, the GTEC kept the letter from the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission? GTEC supposed to put a covering letter and give the letter to university management. They didn't do it. But when GTEC wrote this, uh, Fair Wages wrote this second letter that senior staff are not supposed to end overtime. Quickly, they put their covering letter and secreted it. We were copied, but they never gave us a copy. So where is our copy? We get chance on this letter because our management are implementing it. You will see national chairman, senior staff association, but I don't have a copy. It means what you are doing, you know it is a wrong thing. Hmm. So this is this is an indefinite strike that takes effect immediately. Like beginning now, you are not you are not at work as we speak. Nobody is at work. And and this stretches to even the uh, members of your association at the University of Ghana Medical Center and so many d- d- other places. Correct. Every member who is a senior staff is affected by this strike. Every senior staff, whether you are a nurse, you are lab technician, you are IT technician, you are accountant, you are administrator, you are a business school teacher attached to public university schools, you are part of this strike. Hmm. I don't appreciate your time. I thank you very much for... The thank you, too. I'm grateful. Thank you. So that's the confirmation for the number of you who sent us messages that you, you attended the University of Ghana Medical Center to seek medical care. Only... To, to be told that some of the staff there are on strike. It is because they are members of the Senior Staff Association of the universities, universities, that's the public universities in Ghana. So that's what's happening. In fact, we also understand that some teachers of the basic schools attached to the universities, for instance, the U- U- University University of Ghana Basic School as well. Um, some teachers are attached to this uh, senior staff association. They're also going to be affected by this strike. So it's, it's, a, it's a long stretch, in fact, a stretch of uh, some persons who are going to have to obey this directive to go on strike. So if you're just joining us, the Senior Staff Association of the Public Universities in Ghana, they've declared an indefinite strike with immediate effect. The reason being government persistent disregard for welfare of their members and other conditions of service plus the delay by government in releasing their tier 2 pension funds and a directive by the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, that's GTEC, for the cancellation of the payment of overtime for weekend and holiday work by the senior staff. So we're talking about uh, the senior staff who are going to be processing student admissions and graduations. And you, you do know that the level 100 students across the various tertiary institutions are beginning to report 
to to the various universities to begin the processing of the the admissions and and this is going to be affected by this particular directive for for this indefinite strike action the graduation as well of of students which we do know will, will start all things being equal beginning next week across some of the universities in this country public universities will also be affected by this indefinite strike medical services security dental care laboratory facilities hostel accommodations mortuary services laborers cleaners maintenance estates management all of these people are going to be affected by this indefinite strike action so that's something that we're going to be keeping a keen eye on and see how this indefinite strike action by the senior staff association of the universities public universities in ghana would impact uh, on the universities going forward. But the Functional Executive Committee of the Opposition National Democratic Congress, NDC, has suspended its Northern Regional Vice Chair, Al Haji Abdul Hamid, also known as Al Haji Bewa. Uh, the Vice Chairman has been suspended of allegations of assault on the party's regional treasurer, uh, Haji Shamima Yakubo. Al Haji Bewa allegedly assaulted the NDC Northern Regional treasurer during the party's executive meeting in the northern regional capital of tamale the we understand functional executive committee of the party arrived at the decision following deliberations between the national and regional executives in a crown tuesday a statement issued and signed by the general secretary of the party functional executive committee has said that adequately briefed and about the assault on the Northern Regional Treasurer. At the end of the deliberations, First Executive Committee has decided in accordance with Article 48.1, 48.6, and 48.8b of the party's constitution, that's the NDC's constitution, that with immediate effect, Al Haji Bewa's membership of the NDC has been suspended. Let's get a bit more into this. And Mustafa Gbande is Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, is joining us on the telephone for a conversation. Mustafa, thank you for joining us here on Hot Edition. Thank you for having me here, Pastor. Now, uh, we got wind of, of this information last night. Um, but then again, we, we understand that his uh, suspension has been referred to the National Disciplinary Committee for Adjudication, correct? That is true. So, what what would be the different outcome for this? Because, yes, his membership has been suspended, but if the National Disciplinary Committee will have to sit for a matter to adjudicate it again, what's going, what's going to happen? You know, um, thank you very much, and good evening to our listeners. Um, as indicated in our three days letter, uh, we got wind of that incident the National Executive Committee condemned it in its first reaction. Subsequently, we had uh, invited the Northern Regional Executives to give us a briefing. And so we got some details, and on the basis of that allegation, National Executive Committee decided that it was proper. Uh, in the interest of the party's constitution and its orders, frowning on activities of assault and alleged assault activity to suspend the vice chairman pending investigation and adjudication by the disciplinary committee. Uh, if you look at the way the issues happen, to the extent that basically you can appreciate uh, some assault on the treasurer, it's enough grounds for National Executive Committee to take some of these sanctions to bring order and sanity in the party because we frown on, for example, executives fighting among themselves when the constitution of the party clearly has procedures for redress, which should be a medium that will avert some of these possible uh, uh, chaotic activities that will take place. I see, but the fundamental issue here was uh, something to do with party funds. Have you have you gotten into the merit of, of this whole conflict that led well, to... Well, in the general principle, an accused stands innocent until proven guilty. And in the interest of that, to pave way for further investigations to be conducted, that is why preliminary actions have been taken to suspend the alleged... Uh, individual or individual who was involved in this matter, which is the vice chairman, the original vice chairman, to pave way for all of these uh, processes 
to take place. And then the letter further equates to the fact that some disciplinary measures have been activated. And disciplinary measures will obviously have two sides, including investigating the matter to determine the root causes of it. So the, the, the suspension is, an, uh, uh, is a preliminary action pending all of those investigations and adjudication by the disciplinary committee. If, 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 it's, if there's evidence suggesting that really there wasn't basis for that attack on the treasurer, I mean, um, the party will then look at it from there. If there are evidence that suggesting that um, he attacked the treasurer unprovoked, in any case, the party's constitution frowns on physical assault on members. And so we believe that the decision of the National Executive, Context, uh, National Executive Committee is situated within the premise of our constitution and within measurements of actions that, you know, upfrontly offend our constitution and the process of our party. I see. Now, we're, we're also reading, in fact, I've just gotten some information that um, the, the vice chair of your party, the one who you have just suspended, has been granted bail. And this follows his detention over the allegations of assault on Hajia Shamima Yakobo, your, your original uh, treasurer in the northern region, during that executive meeting a few days ago. So, uh, has this come to your notice that he has been granted bail as we speak? That, that is supposed to be so. Uh, but the criminal action is different from what the party is doing, and they are separate, two separate things altogether. And so I presume that he was granted bail on the basis of uh, the arrest that was effected and subsequent consideration of issues that demands that he is granted bail for further investigation. Now, Musa, before I let you go, Mustafa, I don't know if you've heard this uh, threat by some youth. Uh, who describe themselves as the NDC Bewa Youth Association, who threatened that they would ensure that the, the party loses uh, the, the, that election coming up in that particular area if you do not intervene to clear the man you have just suspended of any wrongdoing. Can you take a listen and then I'm going to take your thoughts on this. If they make any mistake by saying they are going to either sanction or Suspend Alaji Biawa, then we we'll let them know that Tamale belongs to we, the Tamalians. Yes, yes, yes. It is because of the party we are here. And it's because we love the party, that's why we are here. There's no assurance that when the party comes to power, we are going to get anything. We are doing the party for a number of times. We have never gotten anything. Yes, we are doing the party. Just because of the love we have for the party. So, what they are doing, what they are doing, in fact, it is not going to be good for the party within the region. So we are giving them, by the course of the day, we want Alaji to release, or else, what the other counts, the problem is. And we don't care whether the party is going to win or not. What we know is that Alaji is our brother, and he has suffered for this party. And even if we want to weigh the, the, what Kukushanima has contributed to the party, and what Alaji has contributed to the party within the region, everyone here can testify. So, Mustafa, this is a threat to them, that... If you try to sanction, these were their words, sanction the man you have just suspended, they will take it up with you as a party. Well, you have gone ahead to suspend them. That is the threat that they've issued to you. Well, what is very important is that two parties are conflicting. And the party have taken a decision and stand by that decision. Now, the National Executive Committee of the party is fortified and placed in the position to instigate or take decisions that will lead to smooth running of the party within the context of rule of law and respect to fundamental human rights and those decisions have been taken. The Bewa youth still remain our youth of the party. Perhaps some of them do not have deeper understanding of what pertain to some of these actions invoked by the National the Functional Executive Committee. Um, Conversations will be advanced to explain the basis and the reasons why we have to get to this road. Uh, this road. Now, it's one thing exercising a decision in good faith, and it's another thing consumers understanding what the decision is for and what it was about. And so we will continue to engage our youth to understand that 
whoever breaks the party's principle and law will be dealt with according to same as provided under Article 48 of the party's constitution. And that it is in the interest of every individual who is a party member and has some relationship with the NDC who want to exercise their right within the context of acceptable limits. And that if you act beyond the limits that the party tolerates, you will be dealt with in accordance with law. In the morning, I had picked up intelligence over their reaction, and the basis was that the way in manner in which the police acted swiftly when it had to do with an NDC vice chairman is not the same when the same thing occurred. Such violences occurred in Northeast when Honorable Alan Germantin supporters were assaulted or agents were assaulted by uh, uh, members of Dr. Mahmoud Bahamia, the vice president. So they believe that the party should have stood up against the activities of the police. But we as a party will not be against any action of the police within the context of law. Unless, of course, we have some justifiable basis to believe that the police are wrong. And in this matter, the police, we believe, that have the right to effect an arrest pending the accused being able to, to acquit himself to the processes of the law. And so we will continue to engage with our youth to understand the basis of our decision and the context within which that decision will have to be reached. But the party remains supreme at all material point in time, and no member of the party is above the law of the party. Mustafa, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mustafa Bande is Deputy General Secretary of the NDC. Let's stay a bit further on this matter. My colleague Christopher Amako is our Northern Regional Correspondent. He has been seeking reactions from the youth groups, the Bewa Youth Group, for instance, about this particular decision by the NDC Function Executive Committee to suspend the Al Haj Abdul Hamid, known as Al Haj Bewa, the Northern Regional vice chair of the ndc now chris what have they been telling you yes yeah, so alfred basically what you are saying is that uh, the fact that the national executives have condemned the act and uh, have gone uh, ahead to uh, suspend uh, uh, al Bua, it's not uh, the right thing to do because uh, for for them the matter is already with the police and so they should allow the processes to uh, continue. They've not even heard from Allergic Bewa, so why would they take such a hefty uh, decision by uh, uh, suspending him? So uh, for them, they are disappointed in that decision from the uh, national executives. And uh, what they are even seeing is that uh, the said treasurer uh, it, it has not lived long in the party as al Hadi Bewa has, and the contribution of al Hadi Bewa is immeasurable in the region. And so uh, for them, they, they stand disappointed. But I have also engaged uh, a different group who uh, told me that they are happy with the decision of the party because the party seeks to bring sanity in, in the uh, uh, region and no one is about the law. Uh, if you offend, then it means that the party must take a decision on you. I see. But then again, there, there's that other concern about the threats that they issued, which you spoke to them, indicating that they are going to, to uh, ensure that the party loses if al Bewa is sanctioned. He has been suspended. Now, do they still stand by that threat they issued? Yes, so uh, yesterday the threat was that uh, he should be released from uh, police uh, custody. Uh, if not, uh, they are going to ensure that, uh, one, they lock up all officers uh, in the uh, Tamale enclave, that is Tamale North, South, uh, and uh, San Argo constituency. And also, uh, they were going to ensure that uh, the party does not get uh, the needed support that it deserves uh, ahead of the 2024 uh, general election. So far, uh, one of their demands have been met, that is uh, the release, the release of Al Hadi Bua because he was granted bill yesterday. But the other concern is that uh, the said treasurer is the reason why there are cracks in the party in the region. And if the executives do not resolve that matter, uh, then it means that it's going to affect the party. They don't care if the the, the party loses in the 2024. Uh, general election because of this particular matter and it's still standby.
Chris, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Christopher Amakosa, Northing and Savannah Regional Correspondent, giving us updates on uh, this particular situation. If you just joined us, the Functional Executive Committee, that's the FEC of the Opposition National Executive Committee, that's the National Democratic Congress, NDC, has suspended its Northing Regional Vice Chair, Al Haji Abdul Hamid, also known as Al Haji Bewa. The Vice Chairman has been suspended of allegations of assault on the party's regional treasurer. Hajia Shamima Yakubu. Al Haj Bewa allegedly assaulted the NDC Northern Regional Treasurer during a meeting that the executives had in the Northern Regional Capital, Tamale. The Functional Executive Committee arrived at a decision following deliberations between the national and regional executives in Accra on Tuesday. A statement issued and signed by the General Secretary of the NDC, that's Fifi Fiavikwete, said the Functional Executive Committee was adequately briefed about the assault on the Northern Regional Treasurer. At the end of the deliberations, the Functional Executive Committee has decided in accordance with Article 48.1, 48.6 and 48.8b of the party's constitution that with immediate effect, al Bewa's membership of the NDC has been suspended that his suspension has been referred to the National Disciplinary Committee of the NDC for adjudication. And by the notice, his membership of the NDC is suspended pending the hearing and final determination of the matter. That's what you've heard Mustafa Bandeo, the Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, speaking to it. But what we do know as well is that Alhaji Abdul Hamid, who is the Northern Regional Vice Chair of the NDC, has been granted bail yesterday now this follows his dis- detention over allegations of assault on hajia shamima yakubo the ndc northing regional treasurer during the party's executive me- committee meeting in the regional capital tamale so that's what's happening there but straight from the ndc to the npp because the national executive committee of the governing new patriotic party is currently holding a crunch meeting to address challenges barely 10 days to the party's parliamentary primaries. It's not National Executive Committee of the Governing New Patriotic Party's decision. Uh, in fact, this afternoon, the meeting we're learning uh, is barely this 10 days to the party's parliamentary primaries. And the meeting today will seek to, among other things, address current bottlenecks surrounding the January 27 election with a number of aspirants setting over whether they would be on the ballot paper in the various constituencies. Now, the National Appeals Committee of the party has since last week been meeting some of the disqualified aspirants with no clear conclusions affirmed as yet. Now, what we're learning is that the party has received a number of petitions as well against some persons who have declared the intentions to contest and actually went through the vetting process a couple of weeks ago so that is one of the major issues uh, that we, we are looking to hear from the party going forward now this crunch meeting of the npp national executive committee is taking place at the alisa hotel my colleague duke menso poco has been monitoring the meetings connecting with us duke what what what, what do we know about what, when the decision on the petitions the party has received will be communicated publicly well, so, Alfred, the meeting has still been going on. It's been going on since about 3 o'clock. So, they are well entering into about their third hour. Everybody who has to be here, everybody who matters in the scheme of things in the MPP, is here. Some of the aspirants have been seeing them around, those who have been disqualified, who are making a case for them to be reinstated. I don't know if they are still going to make some representations at the neck. But everybody who, who has to be here is here. The meeting has been going on for well over three hours now. But we, 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 we haven't had any determination. Nothing has been communicated to us. We've come outside as it's characteristics of the press when such uh, important meetings are going on. We're waiting for um, what the uh, next decision will be and will be subsequently communicated to us and to the public. I know as well that you you have been uh, working on your sources with respect to, for instance, the, the number of petitions that they have received and then also the, the considerations they are giving to it. What, what, what have we gathered so far? No, what, what, what we have gathered so far is that in the interest of party unity, after the um, primaries, a lot of room is being given to 
um, people who are on the verge of being disqualified to make a case, as it were, to try and convince a greater number of the National Executive Committee meetings to see if within the scheme of things of the party, there can be such a change, uh, there can be, or there may be a change in, in, in their, what you call it, in their favor, so that they would understand, even if they are disqualified, that all the avenues were open to them, it's just that they had a bad case. So that is what we are told is prolonging the meeting. And even though the work of the regional vetting panels have been completed, as well as that of the um, vetting appeals committee chaired by uh, former Deputy Attorney General, CEO of uh, Kwame Osei Prempe. Uh, they are still giving room for people to come here personally to make some cases uh, to the entire next to see if some changes uh, can be made, Alfred. I appreciate your time. And uh, do we have, also have any idea when this meeting is going to end, Duke? Uh, we are told in the next, at, at worst in the next two hours, because it's been going on since 2.30. And uh, yeah, still, still going on, still boxing, still boxing on. Good stuff, Duke. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Yeah, welcome. As Duke Mensopoko is my colleague uh, monitoring the meeting of the National Executive Committee of the NPP, uh, specifically here in Accra. And uh, earlier, my colleague British Edu spoke to a member of the National Council of Elders of the New Petote Party, Professor Aaron Michael Quay, former Speaker of Parliament, uh, who indicated what the considerations of the party is with respect to some persons making comments uh, with regards to what's going to be happening um, on the 27th of this month. He's a fine gentleman, but it's unfortunate that he decided to part company. That's, our, that's the word I'll use, unfortunate. And the utterances that came from him? Well, I like to learn, even from situations that I'm not happy about. And from that situation, I felt any further crack in the MPP would be disastrous. Therefore, we accommodated everything so as to hold our party together. After the complaints, certain complaints about round one, I said we strengthened the rules and we assured society we we're going to make it. Thank God we made it. On the election day, it was very, very smooth. No problem whatsoever, not a single complaint. And I'm telling you how we achieved that, by leaving security entirely to the police. If no matter your position, come, vote, and go. If you brought your security man there who has a gun, he must hand over immediately to the policeman in charge at that station. All these rules were printed and sent to everybody so that the, the so-called intimidation will not arise. I didn't believe in the intimidation, but some people talked about it. So you make a rule that will will make everybody be satisfied and assured. And that is what was the essence of what we did. In life, you realize that even human rights situations, you always have to balance it. And some, in fact, it has been said that your human rights stops where somebody else's right starts. You know, so you must look at the society and the public interest as a whole and balance the equation to have peace. And stability. What would you tell Kennedy Japan then with this statement you've made? Oh, beautiful about the beautiful thing about it is that on that very night, Kennedy Japan made a public statement that the election was free and fair. But, His words. Yes, but going into the next one, you know, you know he's already talking and making some claims already about Senso Boachi and the rest. Oh, I think those ones are some personal issues. But in the interest of the party, I will think that the elders which I'm one of, and the national executive must put it on the agenda to ensure that everybody is put to a certain order so that there will be peace and harmony for the so next election. you should have a conversation with him peacefully? With everybody, whenever certain unpleasant situations arise, not him alone, whoever, yes. Should we expect that meeting soon?
That's uh, my colleague British Edu in that interview with Professor Aaron Michael Kwe, who is a member of the Council of Elders of the NPP, also a former Speaker of the Seventh Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. You're still live here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. Now, the Office of the Special Prosecutor says it is engaged with Interpol and the central authorities of the United Kingdom and the United States under the mutual legal assistance regime over the Airbus saga. The OSP in its half-year report says investigations into the Cecilia Abinadapa case have shown that it is largely in the province of suspected money laundering and structuring adding the special prosecutor will issue directives and further action on the matter in due course the report spans the period of july 1 2023 to december 31 2023 now the half year report made mention of conclusions of investigations into suspected corruption and corruption related offenses regarding the recruitment of exercise of course 51 of cadet officers training at the Ghana Police Academy. Also, the half-year report also made mention of investigations into corruption risk assessment into Government of Ghana payroll administration and ongoing investigation into suspected corruption and corruption-related offenses regarding illegal mining. It further made mention of ongoing investigation in respect of suspected corruption and corruption-related offenses regarding the auction sale of vehicles and other goods by the Customs Division of the Ghana Revenue Authority between July 1, 2016 and August 15, 2022. On the estate of the late Forestry Commission CEO, Kojo Sufriye, popularly known as Sir John, the OSP noted investigations are ongoing in respect of the alleged improper acquisition of state-protected land at the Achimota Forest Enclave and the Sakomo Ramsa site. On prosecution, the report noted that three substantive criminal cases are being tried before the court. So that's the verdict or the report by the special prosecutor. Right after this quick break, we go for the business news with Michael Obadu, followed by the sports news as well. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Are you stressed from a hard day's work? Looking to de-stress and relax over soothing music and self-chats? Then join me, Akofa, on Wind Down 3FM. Keeping it cool, easy, nice and breezy like that. We're okay, starting with Kenny Rogers. Write your name across my heart. Write your name across my heart. Every Monday to Wednesdays, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. And on Thursdays at 8 to 9 p.m. As I play your favorite songs on your favorite dial. 3FM 92.7. Wind down with me, Akofa. Your smooth operator on your way home. Smooth operator. Hello there, good evening and welcome to the business segment here on Hot Edition. Coming up, economist Professor Peter Quarte projects reduction in Bank of Ghana's key lending rate to 28%. To bring you details of that and more shortly, please stay with us. Thank you for staying straight into our top story ahead of the monetary policy committee's 116th policy rate announcement slated for january 29 2024 economist professor peter quote has projected at most two percentage point decline in policy rate to 28 percent from the current 30 percent his projection follows fitch solutions projection of 22 percent policy rate by end of 2024 the following report has the details the central bank has maintained the policy rate at 30 percent since july 2023 in a bid to mop up excess liquidity in the economy to control inflation 
Despite uncertainty surrounding the sustainability of the decline in inflation in 2024, economist Professor Peter Corte anticipates an ease in the key lending rates by at most 200 basis points to 28%. I, I don't expect a significant drop uh, given the increases in oil prices on the global market, the effects of the new taxes that have been introduced are likely to have effects on uh, prices and inflation. And then also in the short to medium term, the effects of election spending. I think for now, um, if the policy rate is kept at the current level or reduced by 100 to 200 basis points, uh, for me, that, that's Meanwhile, Professor Corte believes Fish Solutions' projection that the policy rate will end 2024 at 22% is feasible, although it hinges on certain inflationary pressures. Depending on the way these two factors, the oil price increases on the global market, uh, the new taxes that have been introduced, and even election spending, um, if, if we, we, we spend within the budget limit as the limits of the budget, then that's fine. But if we go beyond, that might likely fuel inflation. So all of these factors will come to play to determine whether uh, Fitch's projection will hold or not hold. That was Professor Peter Quarte ending that report by my colleague Menu Afo. Now, the Director of Academic Planning and Quality Control at GIMPA, Professor Ebenezer Bugrianafo, doubts that Ghana's euro bond holders and commercial creditors will accept the country's proposed haircut. Finance Minister Ken Oferiata, at an initial engagement in London, had announced a potential cut of up to 40% of principal and key and interest rate. Professor Anafo believes the cutoff rate may delay the negotiations. Too much for and I'm not thinking I'm not expecting that these negotiations will end uh, by March. And also uh, the government is so is proposing forty percent tax uh, forty percent cut in the uh, in interest and also forty uh, percent cut in the principal. I think that this is not something that is likely going to be accepted by the euro bond holders. I think that the 40% cut is too much and I would rather be expecting if it was 20% cut, that could have been much more uh, better than the 40% uh, cut. So I, I doubt whether uh, the euro bond holders will accept that 40% uh, cut uh, to me uh, is quite high. So that was Professor Bugri Anafo. He is the Director of Academic Planning and Quality Control at the GIMPA. At GIMPA, Professor Ebenezer Bugri Anafo. Now, away from that, the Africa Tourism Research Network has called on the Tourism Ministry to decentralize its programs and activities to the regions, municipalities, and districts. This, the network says would allow the regions and assemblies to be involved and begin to see tourism as a business worth investing in to be able to develop more tourism products and services to attract tourists to localities president of the network emmanuel frimpo noted that even though domestic tourism was playing its role the authorities must be intentional about replicating most of their programs and activities at lower levels too much focus is on uh, greater Accra region where the other regions are not benefiting to talk about the district. Uh, the Tourism Act requires that we have district, uh, tourism district offices, which uh, at this moment, we, we don't have them. The few that we have are not even equipped. Uh, so we should be able to equip these districts to have district offices or probably tourism desks in these uh, districts where people can go make inquiries about attraction sites in these areas or if they are tourists and they need information to go around they can do that and also build the capacity of the officers in these uh, communities community involvement in tourism is key because now the tourism that we knew some years ago that is visiting attraction sites uh, museums, uh, monuments, and things like that is gradually changing. People are focusing on rural tourism, people are focusing on agro-tourism, uh, sustainable tourism, eco-tourism, and things like that. 
So that was president of the African Tourism Research Network, Emmanuel Frempon, bringing an end to the business segment here on Hot Edition. For more business stories, please check out our website, 3news.com. I am Michael Obudu. Thank you for listening. As always, please stay safe. Up next is Sports and Billy is on standby. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the sports segment here on the 3FM Hot Edition. My name is Bill Ishen, and we're going to start off uh, from the AFCON because Morocco has begun the AFCON campaign, and they are taking on Tanzania right now. The score nil. The score is 1-0 in favor of Morocco, thanks to uh, a close ring finish from Romain Saiz. Later tonight, Zambia will be making their comeback to the AFCON for the first time since 2015, and they will be taking on the uh, Congo. Now, Ghana had their presser earlier today ahead of their big game against Egypt that is scheduled on Thursday at 8 p.m. Head coach Chris Hutton believes the team has to raise their level against the Ferris. Uh, we are very conscious. We are very conscious of how big this game is. And um, uh, hence, this is why in our preparation we have prepared the best way that um, that we can we know the quality of um, the opposition and we will need to make sure that we play at a high enough level to be able to get the result that we want now chris Euton also had added an update to the recovery the fitness level of mohammed kudus ahead of that game um so just a, an update on uh, mohammed uh, mohammed kudus is uh, as most uh, are aware, he joined um, camp later than, um, than anybody else because of uh, an injury that he sustained in his last game for, for West Ham. Uh, we will continue to assess him. We, we have today and uh, tomorrow morning to assess. He has trained. He has trained the last, uh, the last few days. Um, but we will assess him, as I say, today uh, and tomorrow and make, uh, make a decision tomorrow. That was the head coach of the Black Stars, Chris Hewton. Now, Jordan Ayew has stated that the team lacked concentration for most of the game, uh, amounting to their loss against Kivert, but believes that they can't come back against Egypt. We, why not? We didn't concentrate for 90, 95, 98, 100 minutes, and that's what cost us the game. Um, the most important thing for us is to come back, stay focused, be as a team and show different qualities that we have and be more aggressive in every department and we'll be fine. I have total belief in the, the boys, the, the staff who are working really hard and I know that tomorrow will be a, a really good day for us and for Ghana so I'm really confident and yeah. Oh, we are not. So you cannot say it. When we are disqualified, then you can't speak. That was Jordan and you, a forward for the Black Stars. Bringing an end to the sports segment here on the 3FM Hot Edition. My name is Bill Ishen. Up next, it's entertainment with Akofa.
You're still tuned in to Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. It's now time for the entertainment news segment powered by 3 Entertainment. My name is Akofa. On April 10, 2024, the Supreme Court will deliver judgment on the case requesting cancellation of Food and Drugs Authority's directive against alcoholic advertisement by celebrities. The date was fixed by a seven-member panel of the Supreme Court chaired by Chief Justice Getru Tokuno today, Wednesday, January 17, 2024, the Food and Drugs Authority FDA in 2015 effected a directive meant to regulate the use of alcohol among Ghanaians. That aspect of their guidelines bars celebrities from advertising for alcoholic beverages. The authority had explained that due to the influential nature of these showbiz personalities, alcoholic advertisements they are involved in could push minors into alcoholism. Representing the plaintiff Mark Dallenting Osai was Bobby Banson from the Robert Smith Law Group while the Food and Drugs Authority was represented by Justine Amenouvo. Now, the writ indicates that the FDA directive which orders that no well-known personality or professional shall be used in alcoholic beverage advertising is inconsistent with and in contravention of Article 17, Clause 1 and 17, Clause 2 of the 1992 Constitution. He contends that Article 17 17 Clause 1 and 17 Clause 2 of the 1992 Constitution guarantee quality before the law and prohibit discrimination against persons on grounds of social or economic status, occupation among others, and consequently null, void, and unforeseeable. Now, according to the stakeholders of the culture and creative industries, endorsements or advertisement of alcoholic beverages is one of the very few income streams available to them at present. Therefore, any law that restricts their engagement in such activities robs them of their livelihood. Now, before I go, the grand finale of Ghana's current best model show, Ghana's Most Photogenic, the finals is scheduled to come off on January 20 at the World Trade Center in Accra. The five the top five finalists, Yenu, Yanel, Akuya, Ira, Serafina, Fafali, and Black Angela, after weeks of sailing through creative and daunting photogenic tasks, will compete amongst themselves in a fashion show to clinch the Covetous Prize for the winner. Get ready for the grand finale of our very first ever Ghana's Most Photogenic. Twelve models began this journey. After countless fierce photo shoot challenges, had stopping elimination, only five models remain. Who will strut away with the title? Is it Yenu? Yanel? Akuyaira? Black Angela? Serafina Fafali. Join us for the most dazzling runway, intense competition, and the ultimate grand finale on the 20th of January 2024 at World Trade Center, 8 p.m. sharp. Mission is real. The runway is ready and the spotlight is on. Who will be your ultimate model? Ghana's most photogenic beauty through the lens. Well, the winner will be awarded a 10,000 Ghana City's cash prize, a trip abroad, as well as other prizes from the various sponsors. In addition, the winner will be featured in a magazine and selected as a brand ambassador for Media General. So, don't miss out on the action. Tuning for the finale at 8 p.m. and watch your favorite model be a judged winner of Ghana's most photogenic. That will be all the entertainment news here on Hot Edition, powered by 3 Entertainment. My name is Akofa. Thanks for your time. For more news, log on to 3news.com. The 3FM Drive continues.